Welcome to Below the Line, where we talk about working in Hollywood from the crew perspective. My name is Skid. I was an assistant director in Hollywood for the better part of eight years, and now I'm not. Today, we're talking about Arrested Development, a live action sitcom that originally aired on Fox starting in 2003. I have a plot summary. The Bluth family, a collection of oddball, mostly self-absorbed individuals, is forced to manage their real estate development business after dad is arrested for securities fraud. Hijinks ensue. At Rotten Tomatoes, the tomato meter average for the initial three-season run is 98%, and the critics' consensus for the first season reads, Arrested Development puts an ambitiously complex, brilliantly fast-paced spin on dysfunctional family comedy, anchored by the efforts of a tremendously talented ensemble. But even though the early seasons were critically acclaimed, the ratings were low, and Fox canceled the show in 2006. However, six years later, the show got a second life. Netflix picked up the series and released a fourth season in 2013 and aired a fifth season split between 2018 and 2019. Those seasons were not as well received, however. The tomato meter average is 41%, and the critics' consensus for season four reads simply, they've made a huge mistake. For insiders, that line was also a running gag on the show, so the folks at Rotten Tomatoes are having a bit of a laugh. Here on Below the Line, of course, we're not focused on what the critics thought. I was the second second assistant director for the first season, and my guests today were both sides of the Fox-Netflix divide. First, Ross Novi, one of the first ADs from the first three seasons. Ross, welcome to Below the Line. Good to be here. Ross, if memory serves, we first met when I was a PA on Drowning Mona, and you were AD in second unit. Is that correct? Yeah, that was a... One ill-fated day that I did second unit, absolutely. <laughs> and then uh, overlapping again uh, when Arrested Development rolled around. Uh, skimming your credits at IMDb, it's pretty clear you've stayed busy. What are you working on now? I'm currently on Superstore, which is in its fifth season. Uh, and I should point out, I also did the pilot of Arrested Development. So I've been there. I was there from the beginning until the beginning became the end. <laughs> okay. All right, Ross. Well, glad to have you on today. Next, Chuck Canzanieri, you were the key set production assistant for all three of the original seasons. Correct. Good, good to be here. Now, Chuck, you've joined us here on Below the Line before when we talked about PA Boot Camp, the training program you deliver for folks new to the industry. Tell me more about what you're up to now. Well, still doing PA Boot Camp. We just had one in South Carolina, so we've been traveling around quite a bit, plus our monthly in Los Angeles. And in my in-between time, I have been working on season two of The Rookie. Well, welcome, Chuck. Thanks for taking time to join us as well. And then finally, in our fourth chair today is Mike Loomer. Loomer, you were the on-set dresser for the fourth season after Netflix relaunched it. That's correct. Now, you've also been a guest on Below the Line before when we talked about Jericho. What are you working on these days? Well, I'm working on recovering from a torn Achilles tendon, uh, which happened in February. And I worked on that thing until April. And uh, it's not healing well. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm working on some physical therapy. I'm sorry to hear, Loomer. I hope that uh, goes well and gets you back on your Thank feet. You. No pun intended there. Jesus, that sounds awful. <laughs> but thanks for taking the time to join us today. All right, folks, let's turn our attention to Arrested Development. First, let's sort of set the stage about how this show was done. The early season, I'm more familiar with the logistics. Loomer, you weigh in where things might have been different, and we'll get into how things changed. But, so we were doing 22 episodes a season, and we were shooting in Culver Studios. Other background on that? Other thoughts about how it came together? Well, just to back up a little bit, the pilot, we did at Manhattan Beach Studio. So uh, we did that, and it was with the Russo brothers, who had gone on to do some other great things. Uh, and their intention from the beginning was to do very documentary style, three cameras, no video village, just really run and gun, looking off onboards, uh, and then putting it together later. That definitely obviously changed after a little bit. It became more of a sitcom staged show. But from the beginning, that was their intention, was to make it feel very, like the, kind of like what The Office became in my current show, Superstore, as well. Well, and as you say, Ross, that was um, still pretty fast-paced moving. It was all handheld, as I recall. I don't remember doing dolly shots or no, really a no, lot no. of setup on anything we did. No, it was a very fast-shooting show. We had an extraordinary amount of scenes every day. And I think we'd have like 60 scenes in a script as opposed to I do 30, 35, maybe do 40 in some. But we'd have 60 and just every setup would be quick. We'd go through it. We'd probably reshoot it before the end of the week. But everything was meant to move fast and funny. And even then, though, we were doing a lot of location work as well. I mean, for five days an episode, I think yeah. we'd be on location for a day and a half, if not two days every week. Yeah, yeah. We were out a lot, a lot in uh, Marina Del Rey. 
which is a, a terrible place to shoot. <laughs> it's a lot of sounds and noises and people, but that's where the banana stand was. And so we were out a lot, especially at Culver. We'd roll outside the gates and go into Culver City and shoot at the hotel or the city hall. There was a lot of great locations right there. Yeah, I also worked on the pilot, and I remember when you said Manhattan Beach Studios, it struck me as odd because I think the entire time of the pilot, we were only at the studio for one scene, like not even half a day. The rest of it was all running and gunning around on location. I was amazed at the logistics that had to go into putting this pilot together, which is why I was twice as amazed when I got a phone call a few weeks later saying, hey, we're going to series. They actually picked us up. Yeah, and um, one other little story that happened in the pilot, which was we were going to shoot uh, a certain week and we had to push because Michael Serra was Canadian and didn't have his papers in order. So we had to delay for him. And at that point, it was like, we're delaying for this kid? Who is this kid? Like, can we recast the kid? <laughs> but uh, it worked out. <laughs> you know? They knew something. Now, how many days did you guys have to shoot the pilot? I feel like it was eight, but uh, I could be wrong. It might have been seven, but it was, it's always around that. So a couple of extra days for that. But again, still, for the amount of work you were doing, things were just as intense then as carried into the show. Yeah. Now, when we're way in here, season four is structured a little differently. Each episode sort of deals with one member or two members of the cast. I got the sense that they were staggered out in a way that accommodated actor schedules. We'll talk more about the actors later, but you tell us what was different or what might have been the same. Absolutely. The first three seasons of that show made B-list and unknown actors into superstars. So trying to get them back in to shoot season four was a disaster. Every day it was a struggle just to, to try and figure out what the storyline we were going to shoot that day was based on actor availability and who could be there for two hours here or three hours there just to try and get something banged out. And on top of that, you know, it sounds like, especially talking to ADs, the three of you guys, that things were very organized for those first three seasons. When it got to season four, there was, there was no, no organization. There was no planning. <laughs> there was no script until a couple hours after we started every day. I'm not really joking about that. We would come in in the morning and we'd get coffee and we'd get set up and we would sit and wait for a couple hours while they figured out who was going to be in that day and then tried to write something for them to shoot. It was chaotic and uh, it didn't help. That was the first foray into uh, original programming for Netflix. So they, um, there was a lot of disorganization and it, it was a struggle. It was definitely more of a struggle than I think you guys dealt with in the first three seasons. Well, if it makes you feel better, we never got a script either, but at least we had everyone there. But it was the same process, but we, like you're saying, we had everyone. So we would come, I'd get my script uh, Monday morning at 5 a.m. for that week. And we would just have to say, all right, Jason can learn the lines quick. Michael can, we'll be in the living room. And then we'll shoot a scene, probably reshoot it because they'll change it. But like Jessica Walter, we'd wait till later in the week and, and Jeffrey Tambor, just because they weren't going to put up with that and try to <laughs> learn a scene that morning. So we had the same thing. I mean, that was always the process. There were definitely, uh, you know, problems. Uh, and, and we dealt with them. They were, they were difficult to deal with. But uh, there were some, some definite struggles there. But I remember that one of the things that Netflix, they had to have their first shot of the day had to be really quick. So we got in the habit of Troy, the, the director, DP, camera operator, that one guy, and the first assistant camera would prep a camera. They'd come in a little bit early and they'd prep a camera and they would shoot what we called the scorcher. So ADs would call us in and they would roll camera on some establishing shot or just some rando shot that we may or may not use. And it always ended with Troy walking into the shot and tapping his watch. So I don't know what the, uh, what the, the big deal was or who needed to have that, but we just, we would shoot that scorcher and then sit until something was ready to be shot. And it just, it was odd. Nice. <laughs> so, so Ross, you did not go back for the fourth season. But... Uh, there was a time I, I was uh, talking about doing it. John and Medea, one of our producers was potentially going to go back and, and we talked about doing it and we knew that it was a, a very, huge scheduling puzzle because of the scheduling things that Loomer is pointing out. Um, and it just ended up pushing. And so it went out of both of our areas of availability, but we knew it was going to be a super difficult scenario. 
So what other challenges do you guys remember from the early seasons carried over? I, Ross, I had forgotten that the scripts came in late on, on that show. Um, I was working with first team. And so I think my focus on just having everyone ready all the time, perhaps I wasn't as, as attentive to what was going on, on set, but um, what other kind of challenges do we have shooting again? What was unusual even at the time, I think for this kind of sitcom. Well, I mean, just to, to speak to that point, like when we, shot the finale episode we actually shot it after our rap party i don't know the rap party was scheduled before it i remember being at the rap party and being approached by mitch herwitz who asked do you think we can get the queen mary to shoot the episode this week i mean that's how late in the process it was (laughs) we're at the rap party talking about what location we shoot the finale and oh yeah we'll check into it let's see if it's available (laughs) and later on the queen mary for the finale so things were very fluid which made for a very light prep week. I mean, prep was light. And then we would just be uh, able to just, you know, uh, adjust on the fly. That's just what it was. Chuck, what did you think of those challenges? I remember the way the Russo brothers would learn to roll with it. I think the first few episodes they did together, and then they got in this habit of not getting fussy with the camera. They would often say to the director of photography, like, give me a wide and a tight. And leave it more to having that space for the actors to go off and help out work the scene. We always had uh, one of the staff writers on set. Not that the scenes were being improvised at at all, but they would certainly, when you have someone like David Cross, when they got comfortable with Will Arnett, they got very comfortable with letting them play with the scene, which would lead to some great moments. I remember one specifically with Ross, when uh, David Cross is auditioning for the fire sale and his character Tobias misreads the card and goes off on a tangent about it being a fire. They recorded a whole bunch of footage and you knew that they're just going to take the best bits and they're going to edit it down. But I remember specifically that it was, as much as we talk about the chaos, it was a very happy moment for Ross because he said how he had like a front row seat to watching David Cross do his thing. There was a similar situation when uh, Job has to swallow a key. And they it's on the show, it's only about 20, 30 seconds, but they went on for minutes with him going through a full physical, like silent slapstick routine of him having trouble swallowing that key. The, the best part of that show for me was watching the performances because it was absolutely amazing to watch those actors take the script that that existed and then make it their own and then improvise and say, you know, what would be great is if I had some mustard and we could do mustard on hand sandwiches, which was something that the, the actors just came up with on the fly. And it was, it was so amazing to watch their performances. Well, that's a good segue in talking more about the cast. Like it really was stacked with talent. Folks known and unknown really brought their A game to the comedy of the show. Absolutely. Yeah. The performances from everyone on that show was fantastic. And there were, you know, major A-list celebrities, Liza Minnelli, that, that came on and, and were essentially bit players, but fantastic. And the whole show as an ensemble was just, it was amazing to watch those performances. It was chaotic to make, but it was fun to watch. You also have to give a lot of credit to Jason Bateman, who it's hard to think of now at the time, but he wasn't like a solid bankable person to put a show around at the beginning. But when you watch the pilot, he is so solid in that central performance that this series pretty much single-handedly, it's hard to say because that was behind the scenes and it certainly changed my personal opinion of his abilities, but then seeing also how his career has skyrocketed since this show. Speaking of fall on careers, I know that uh, overlapping with some of those folks later, I saw Judy Greer in a couple of film sets afterwards, and we always had a laugh thinking back to the time she showed up on Arrested Development. And then I worked with Tony Hale a little bit on Veep later, and uh, again, having those Arrested Development days in the background. You guys must have crossed with these folks since the original shooting as well at times. See, I've worked with Jason. Uh, I worked with him briefly on The Muppets, and uh, I congratulated him on winning the Emmy for the... Uh, directing this year, which he directed on Arrested Development as well. He had a big episode. And I agree with what Chuck said. I mean, he he needed someone in the center who can, you can, you can build around and who's a, a, just a great guy and also a leader among that, that group. And and you could rely on him. 
And that makes everything sane. Because you can have a lot of craziness going, but you need at least someone. You need some firm ground. And Jason was always that firm ground. It seemed like his his real personality was much like uh, the character he was playing where he was the, the one centered anchor who never had a sporadic moment. He just always had to deal with the chaos around him in real life and in the script. So yeah, Jason Bateman is spectacular. Well, Loomer brings up a great point. I would say that everyone is perfectly cast and that's what I'd say about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly perfectly cast. <laughs> And that's, the, that's when you have a great show is, yeah, some actors can do anything, but the best casting is exactly who they are and what they do. I admit I haven't seen all of the fourth season and uh, the, I watched some of it and it, it just didn't hook me. But uh, yeah, did you guys get Henry Winkler back for the fourth <laughs> season? Because he was a pleasure to work with, I know, when I was there. Did he carry through as well? Yeah, briefly. He was there for a couple of scenes, but yeah, just, yeah. It, it was hard because he's busy, everybody's busy, so he'd run in and we'd, you know, we'd drop what we were doing on one set and run to another stage, quick throw up cameras, shoot Henry's one scene in the bathroom, and then back down to where we were just while he was you know, over lunch or between scenes somewhere else. So yeah, it was, uh, it was brief, but it was fun to see him, fun to have him come in. <laughs> And did you have a director for each episode as in a traditional switching back and forth? Or it sounds like you guys were prepping and shooting just everything all the time. Like that's unusual. Yeah, correct. No, no solid director or no individual directors for episodes that I can remember. It was, it was Mitch Horowitz and uh, Troy Miller. Troy Miller. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and Troy was a DP also and they directed and uh and uh, uh mitch was on stage the entire time uh, and so yeah it it like mitch kind of had it in his head and then they would kind of just work it out with what they they had every day but you know we would have a, a a call sheet that had 40 pages of work on it and I, i'm not joking 40 pages of work and it was just whatever we could get to that day with the scheduling <laughs> so, um, I, now maybe stories like that make me remember our experience more fondly but uh, I, I feel like the crew was uh, I, I don't know I felt like um, as in many a difficult show the crew was pretty tight I seem to recall from when we were shooting those early seasons but well, again I was only there the first season but uh, what, do you, what do you guys recall from the early days I mean Chuck I don't really remember positive experiences from it I mean that happens anyway I don't remember negative it washes away with the sands of time. Otherwise, I probably couldn't live. But uh, I mean, production, I thought, had it easier in a way. Even though it was very chaotic, we kind of knew the chaos, whereas the writers had a much more difficult time. They were there later, and I, I heard a lot more grumbling. There's a lot more turnover. But I thought in terms of shooting, everything was fast and, like I said, chaotic, but it wasn't. Uh, our, our hours weren't particularly long. Uh, you just kind of rolled with it, and I don't know. It just it wasn't that bad. No, and it was surprisingly structured for, I know what we're talking about right now makes it sound like they just threw everything in the air and hoped that something would come together, but you couldn't layer in this deep of, a, of an amount of inside jokes and, and subtle setups without having some kind of planning along the way. So even something like what happens to Buster's hand eventually i remember actually asking mitch it was like when he was in the water shouting out lucille i was like when did you know this was going to happen and he's like this was part with the original pilot this is why we named her lucille in the first place <laughs> you know going back to the to the lucille thing is uh, one of the things that that our production designer did in fourth season was really call out some of those um, those callbacks. I remember one uh, people mover at an airport and the mural as, as Jason Bateman is, is going down the people mover, the mural is the queen Mary and the seal with the, the oh, hand. Fun. And we had lots of, lots of, uh, of Easter eggs and callbacks. That's fun. Who is the production designer for season four? Do you recall? Uh, I'd have to look it up. I don't remember. Uh, Sorry to put you on the spot. I know it's, yeah, it's always a deep yeah. dive to go back in the past. <laughs> <laughs> for any name so yeah it's uh, it's a it's been a long time that, that shows way back there now well how about pleasant memories guys what other whether it's favorite actors or favorite scenes what else comes back to you guys from the film and on the show 
I got one for sure because it was the one time I almost completely blew a take. And it was when Judy Greer was working as uh, Kitty Sanchez and she's mm-hmm. trying to seduce Job. And the hair department gave her this kind of hair that she would, was supposed to let her hair down. But when she pulls it out and shakes her head, the hair actually pops like a piece of popcorn. And for whatever reason, I had to be on the set in the room, like I think I was helping with the camera. So I was right behind the camera when they did the first take and she pulled that hair and I didn't know because I don't think it was directly written in the script that this was going to happen. She shook the hair and the hair popped up and I, I'm sure something, some noise escaped my mouth, but not enough that ruined it. But I almost completely broke up right there uh, in the, right next to where they were acting. <laughs> That's great. Now, Chuck, I thought you were going to say the one you almost ruined is when you had a credited role because you actually played a part in one scene, right? I don't remember what season it was. Season two, it was the episode Good Grief, which I at least like is one of the more well-known episodes. Um, I was given, I didn't even know I was given a credit until I saw it on IMDb because it was really just a background part to walk through a scene. And they only had time to do a couple of takes and both times my cue was mistimed. So there was supposed to be this cross with Will Arnett and both times I had to like redo my pace or I would have crashed right into him. And even you can see on the take they use, it's like, it looks like this background person doesn't know what they're doing because I, I come within inches of actually colliding with him. You've never let that go, huh? <laughs> still angry at me for all those years from that bad cue. They mention it on the audio commentary. <laughs> yeah, it, they actually, they do audio commentary on that episode and they they mentioned me in there and it was like oh no ross loomer do you guys ever have scenes on camera for this one uh yeah i was i was i played a director um i forgot the episode but we were on a boat we were in the marina and i was as if i was the director filming job on his boat i don't remember the scene actually and the russo brothers are right behind me they were actually directing the episode but i played the director which uh had to uh satiate my goals at the time for a few years uh, <laughs> to at least play one on tv so you know that was, and i think i was picking out a video uh at an adult film store i think i was the hands picking out something inappropriate i was always willing to do that stuff so <laughs> this is one of the few shows where i haven't had a, a cameo i know you got a good look i don't can't believe that it is you i like remember it. luke Remember Loomer for all your future casting needs. <laughs> as, as long as there's no running in the immediate future. <laughs> yeah, so for folks, uh, Loomer does have a good look. And if you go back to our Jericho episode on the Facebook page, you can see uh, some of the photos of Loomer that uh, we posted then. Um, were there a lot of other crew showing up and stuff? One of the best, I mean, it's hard to get crew in shows now. They, they've really clamped down uh, networks like that's where they want to have their point of emphasis is god forbid you have you have writers and crew in the show oh my god that's what's wrong but um we had our prop guy in one of our, the funnier bits where job's making fun of everyone's suits and he's like oh, oh the guy in the 500 hundred dollar suit's gonna tell me you know what's right and wrong and that was like our prop guy he was making fun of that was a good little bit and i feel like i feel like everyone ended up in places at different times make up for when we did a telenovela takeoff behind the scenes, we had our makeup artists in the shot. And yeah, I mean, it was simpler times. <laughs> I don't remember a lot of our crew getting that opportunity. Because we were so chaotic, we always kind of had a, a, a standing crew of uh, background talent that was always there. So mm. I think they just kind of went back to the well quite a bit when it came to that. Now, Loomer, for you guys, with as tough as that was and the, the challenges being... I'd say honestly of a higher degree. Did you guys bond over that as well? Was it a, was it a tight crew or was that kind of chaos? I don't know, make it harder to bond. All the onset crew definitely bonded. You know, we were, we were in the trenches together and that was, uh, again, with, with Netflix being one of their first attempts, we shot long hours. I'm like 16s on a regular basis. Um, so our onset crew was really tight. What kind of unfortunately fell apart a little bit was the uh, the off production crew that they couldn't prepare for anything. So with a with a call sheet that had forty scenes on it, they can't prep forty scenes. So there was a lot of time when it was just 
those guys would come in and set up one or two sets that they thought might get shot that day. And then they were gone and there was no support behind the scenes because those guys didn't have any way to support us. So it was, it was difficult in that way. But um, as with all tough shows, you know, that the, the crew that shot it, we all bonded. We are, you know, all loved each other and worked hard with each other. So yeah, it was definitely a, a, a good family vibe with that. And the actors the same way, even the, the actors that didn't come in all the time, they really felt like they were part of something big. They knew they were part of something big and they, uh, they would hang out with us. And rarely um, once they got made up, would they go to their trailers and usually just hang out in chairs with us most of the day. If I could ask Ross, I know during our seasons, there was the time where David Cross, and then later on Jeffrey Tambor joins Blue Man Group. Mm -hmm. When, do you know how much prep you had of knowledge of knowing that we were going to have to have a blue David Cross? Because I remember it was one of those things where the first time we did it, it took hours, and then eventually they found ways to streamline the process. Yeah, I don't remember when it first was initiated, but like you said, there was a a little bit of discovery, and, and one of my fondest, worst memories, because I was a huge David Cross fan coming into the show, from Mr. Show was having him all in blue screaming at me on set because he'd been waiting too long to get into the scene. He was getting all blue for, but it was hard to assess how long it was going to take to get him all blue. So here's this guy, you know, looks like a Smurf yelling at me, <laughs> who's a, I'm a big fan of, and I'm trying to look serious and concerned. And yeah, we're going to take care of it. But I'm also like, this is so absurd. This is crazy. <laughs> But I also understood from him, you know, he's like I'm sitting around looking like a jerk. So I don't know. Uh, it was it was an interesting uh, setup. I mean, how do you make that faster? Eventually, you just dip him by the feet into a big bat, yeah, right? I mean, that's what we did. That's what we did. Get an assembly line, drop him. And, I don't know. Yeah, it was a lot of let's put him in lawn sleeves. It was make it so you didn't have to do so much of him. That would be blue because I drew the short straw on the first day when it came to clean up. And like all the other vehicles had moved out. The only trailer that was still there was the makeup trailer because it was like two hours after camera wrap, they were still getting the blue off of his body. (laughs) Yeah, you got to just learn by doing. Other cast stories. So we, uh, I'm sure you probably will will know and I I won't mention the name, but uh, there was one of the uh, old school actors that worked on that show that was a, a fairly predominant chain smoker. Uh, also was not very mobile. And so it got to the point where we were just, she would sit in the set, in the chair, lighting the next cigarette with the current cigarette, never stopped. Wow. The actor would walk in smoking and walk out smoking. And uh, for that, <laughs> that was nuts. You don't see that much anymore. Um, I remember an incident where we were doing driving shots with Liza Minnelli and Jason Bateman and driving onto the Fox lot and, they were behind us. We were in a camera car. They weren't attached. I think we were just driving alongside. But we went through, and they didn't have their Fox ID passes on them. And they were giving them a hard time. And I'm like, it's Liza Minnelli and Jason Bateman in a, in a Corvette, I think it was. It was a really obvious shooting situation, even if you didn't recognize fairly famous people. But this guy was doing due diligence, you know, just in case. And it took like 10 minutes and finally like we hopped off the shot maker. Can you let in Liza Minnelli, please? Can you let him into the lot? So it's very, uh, I remember that. I remember there was a scene with Jason Bateman getting into an elevator. And for whatever reason, my lockup was the other side of the elevator. And he gets in with a bunch of background. So he pulled me aside and he goes, he goes, I need you to do me a favor. He goes, you know, Star Trek, right? And I'm like, okay. He goes, you know, every time the doors open on Star Trek, it makes that little whistle noise. And I was like, yeah, I think I, and I demonstrated. And he goes, yeah, that's it. He goes, he goes, it really is going to mean a lot to me. If every time they say cut and it's time to open up those doors, if I can hear the whistle noise with those doors, that, that's just really going to gonna play well to me. And I'm like, okay. So we cut and let Jason out and props opens the doors and I do the whistle noise. And he turned to the background and he goes, the kid is such a nerd. We, ju- we just can't get him to stop. We ask him to not do it, but he insists every time. <laughs> Jason was a trip. I ran into him at a Dodgers game once of all places, and he called out skid. And I, did, yeah, I had to double take because you see folks out of context sometimes, and uh, you, just don't, you just don't think about it twice. But, yeah, he was always he was great. To me, the real breakout was Will Arnett. 
who I didn't know before the show, even though he had worked in TV for a while, but watching him and especially him with Jason sort of bouncing off each other. And sometimes Will would really push Job about as far as you could. I remember we did a scene on the boat. It was the scene where off camera, you hear that he threw a woman overboard and he sort of throws a life preserver and he's talking to, to Michael Sarah. That was another one of those situations where like, for whatever reason, I had to be on the boat laying down on the ground so I didn't appear on camera. And he did a take and it was so big. Like even he knew, they said cut. And I think first the Russos came up to him and said, so can you do it bigger? (laughs) And then Chuck, the the writer went up and he was, and just very deadpan as, as he would be. He just looked up, they stared at each other and he goes, a little less next time. Yeah, Tony Hale and I became pretty good friends on the set. And that was a, a lot of fun to watch his performance with the big hand and just going from from Tony into his character was just always fun to watch. And, and I mean, all the characters on that show were so fun to watch. That was what, what made the show on a on a tough one for us was being able to watch those those actors perform those characters. It was great. Mm-hmm. So do any of you know anyone that went back for fifth season, whether things got better or continued in the, in the vein of fourth season? I know it was reorganized and written a little more traditionally and spread out over two full years. And I think they did two drops on it, but does anybody know anyone that, that went back? No, no, again, I, I, I was, someone contacted me about working on it again, the schedule didn't work, but again, it was also, sometimes you just can't go back home. <laughs> you got to move on. That was a wise, wise choice on, on your part. You, uh, you left that show with great memories, and I, I left it with great memories and a heart back. <laughs> now, and what about other Netflix shows? Have you guys, anybody else done a Netflix show? Yeah, I've done a, a couple of shows uh, with Netflix, and they've definitely become more of a traditional um, production network. They've uh, really kind of fallen into line now with what everybody else does but at the time they were they were fresh and new and green and we had a lot of money they would give us whatever we wanted financially but uh it was it was just the schedule of all the um of all the actors trying to work around them that would be my guess that to, to to carry the slate of shows they're doing now more of the tried and true methodology would have to to come to the come to the front on that so for all the folks who are working those shows i'm i'm pleased to hear that things have gotten better there it's also good to to point out that uh, Netflix is getting ready to sign their own contracts with uh, with I. So hopefully we've got some good negotiating grounds there. Other stories people want to tell or just general topics you think we should uh, address? In addition to the Russo brothers, there was a lot of other, obviously, really talented people who directed. Paul Feig was, was a mainstay there. Um, Jim Hawkinson, who was the cinematographer there, he also went on to community with the Russos. So a lot of people kind of moved from that that area to other areas. I know, Chuck, were you on Sunny in Philly with me? No, I wasn't. Okay, because I know some of us went over to It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. That guy who did the elevator thing, you didn't want him around anymore, huh? That, uh, he kind of he's, noise there. <laughs> he's like the black ops of production. We always put him in the most dangerous areas and would deny his existence if questioned. <laughs> that was Chuck's role. Always. But uh, yeah, there was a lot of obviously good, talented directors who kind of went on that. I remember Jay Chandrasekhar, who came in from Broken Lizard and got, I think, some of our most complicated episodes, or at least a two-parter that he did. And then he went off to prep Dukes of Hazard from there. Oh, I was a big fan of Jay's from Super Troopers. And uh, he actually signed a poster for me. I forget what film he had coming out of the time, but uh, he wrote on it... uh, Skid quit stalking my sister, which I'm pretty sure was a case of mistaken identity. And I just remember having to schedule all those little pieces we would do that we knew were going to be on camera for the smallest amount of time, like Lucille pulling into the parking meter, pulling in her car in in the wrong direction that we had to do over and over again to get it just right so that it was funny. Or all the stuff with Ed Begley Jr.'s character having the hair issue so that the yeah. hair would constantly blow off his face. It's this quick little gag, but it's something that takes a lot of preparation and a lot of time to execute the joke just right. One of the big ongoing gags uh, for season four was the Cinco de Cuatro uh, celebration that uh, we had, it, it was a, you know, Mexican fair and we had that thing set up a dozen different times all over, sometimes on stage as 
as our cover set. But often we would shoot it and set it up out at uh, um, the harbor by the uh, the Queen Mary. But the jokes that flew out of that thing, because the the production designer and decorator really put a lot into each of the booths that the actors could play off of. So it was oftentimes we'd, they'd walk in there and Mitch would see something just hilarious. And so we would shoot that and that, that Cinco de Cuatro whole section was just hilarious to watch come together from the actors and the set point. Well, that, that reminds me, we had a scene, I think it was our final season where it was like this year end party, but throughout the season, if anyone famous was on the Fox lot, we'd do a shot of them entering the penthouse and waving like they were entering the party. And then we wouldn't see them in the party itself, but it was just like this cavalcade of stars. Like we'd hear someone's, uh, someone's over on the uh, restaurant confidential. Quick, grab them, come, have them come over for a minute. We'll set up and just have them walk, come in and wave. And then eventually they strung a bunch of those celebrity cameos together and, and then got into the scene with the regular people. I also remember Ben Stiller. We had him for a couple of episodes. But for some reason, he wasn't available to, like, spend more than an hour. Like, literally, he was explained to us, like, he's on his way from West L.A. to Hollywood. So we can get him for, like, an hour and a half. And we can shoot only his side of these scenes. Which, even at the time, I was like, is he that busy? Like, literally, we have to get him in transit across the city. We can't get a, a four-hour block. But, but we shot, like, half, like, eight different scenes and just picked them up later on. Um, it wasn't my episode, but I just remember that. I was like... Wow, that's, this guy's busy. This is a busy guy. <laughs> you might as well film his scenes in the car. And it's just- Yeah, I mean, I'm surprised they didn't. That's all I can do. I, I, I'm on my way. I gotta get here. Yeah, we had the same thing with, with Ben Stiller uh, in season four. Uh, you know, we, we, were, we were shooting at a bar in, in Hollywood and he would stop by on his way to his other project and then he would stop by on his way back from that project to his beginning project. And he'd give us like two or three hours here, but he had a really good body double that could be the back of his head all the way up to about right here. And then it didn't look like him, but yeah, it was, uh, he was nuts. But that wasn't just him. That was everybody. Cause you, you two guys, you three guys from those first three seasons made those actors. Yeah, they, they were, you know, some of them were well known before, but everybody on that show blew up because of Arrested Development. And it made it hard for them to come back and shoot Arrested Development because Arrested Development had made them so big. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It does say something about, I think, the nostalgia that everyone held for the show that they did come back to do it, that you could get anything off the ground at all. And it sounds like, from what you said, they were committed to that as well. But obviously, at this point, their other commitments were, were more than particularly a fledgling network as Netflix was at the time could really navigate successfully. Yeah. So season six then, right. That's uh, now that Netflix is making all the money in the world, they should be able to buy them out and actually have them committed again. Uh, you guys want to go back for that? I'm, I'm waiting for season seven. That's what I'm going to jump in. <laughs> I, I'm with Chuck season seven. We all come back. I'm out. I'm out till seven. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, we'll put a pin in that guys. And uh, when it does, uh, do plan on coming back here on Below the Line. We'll talk about it again. Thanks, guys, for joining today. It was fun catching up. Good you. Thank you, kid. This was good. Listeners, I'd love to hear what you thought of the episode. You can send an email to skid, S-K-I-D, at below the line, one word, dot biz. That's B-I-Z. I also appreciate your feedback via iTunes, where I review your ratings and comments, and Facebook, where I post photos and other behind-the-scenes materials at Podcast Below the Line. Please do rate us and tell your friends. And finally, for updates and other info, you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram. On both platforms, search for Pod Below the Line. Thanks to Curtis Five for our music and John Juan for our logo. The logo is available on t-shirts, mugs, and stickers at redbubble.com. Thanks for listening. Hope you join us again next time. Uh, Tony Hale and I became pretty close on the set, and uh, he was always just... just Montessa, be quiet, please. I, got to hear you. I know, I can still hear you. You got to be quiet. You got to be silent, all right? Yeah, no, mm, yourself. <laughs> She's five. Sorry. <laughs>